Okay, today is July 11th, 2013. My name is Mary Larson and we're here in Edmond with Mrs. Jerry Brown. Mrs. Brown, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. We really appreciate it. Um, I was wondering if to start out, if you could just tell us a little bit about uh, your, your family as you were growing up and where you grew up. Yeah. Oh, I grew up in Oklahoma City and I was born in the University Hospital on October 28th, 1921. Uh, 11 years after my older sister, so I was sort of a surprise. And uh, I lived in Oklahoma City and all of my childhood and all my youth. Uh, I grew up on Northwest 33rd Street and uh, I went to Edgemere to grade school. I went to Harding to junior high and Classen High School to for high school. Uh, I uh, was active in sports while I was in junior high and high school. And uh, then from there I went on to OSU to school because that's just where I was going. Well, back when, when you were in junior high and high school, what, what kind of opportunities were there for playing sports? For uh, well, I, I was lucky in that my grandfather taught me how to swim when I was a little girl. I was about, well the year I was four years old he decided I could swim well enough that I could swim with the big kids. And I, I learned to swim in Turner Falls and what was Old Blue Hole and then this pool under the falls. And the next summer when I was five he decided I swam well enough I could dive through the falls. But that's what our family did in the summer and it was before air conditioning so we'd go down there and camp out and whichever uncle or father was not was on vacation would be the male who was there and then the rest of us would just be there because it was cool and my parent my mother was indian and my grandparents my grandfather was first was the legis in the first chickasaw legislature and he was the first uh secretary to the first legislature of the Chickasaw tribe. And what was his name? Uh, Joseph Edwin Colbert. Okay. And uh, we, uh, the, the land, everybody had land, a uh, part of their head right there in the Arbuckles, so we had plenty of places to stay. And so I did that, and I did go to Edgemere to school, which was a real privilege because it was an experimental school, and even then, we had a PE teacher, a music teacher, and an art teacher, uh, as well as a homeroom teacher, which was sort of unusual in a grade school in that day and age. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to Harding, which was junior high, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade then. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I went to Classen High School, which when you started to Classen in that day and age, you declared if you were going to college or business college, and they arranged your basic courses so that you had the things you had to have to, for admission into those. And then electives were other things that you wanted to take. And I knew forever I was going to be a teacher. And after I graduated, and uh, my father died when I was a senior in high school, mm -hmm. uh, but I still knew I had to go to college. So I went on to OSU, which was Oklahoma A&M College then, and I went in the fall of 1939 and graduated in 1943. Uh, I was active in the pep club. I worked as uh, first in the dining hall at Murray Hall where I lived all four years. And uh, then I worked as a proctor after my first year. Uh, the other three years I worked as a proctor. at, And I, because I'd had four years of Latin in high school, and I took another year for because it was easier to keep up the same language. Uh, I ended up with a job that was very helpful that was tutoring uh, a couple of high school kids. One was the daughter of the dean of education, the other was the daughter of the dean of engineering, and they were struggling with high school Latin, so that was a great job because it paid better than the campus job. The campus job paid 25 cents an hour. but. For $100 the first semester that I went to OSU, I was able, that's how much I earned that summer, I was able to pay my first month's room and board, 
pay my fees and buy my books, and I had four dollars left over. That's impressive. Well, what what was it that drew you to OSU? I mean, you said that you you just kind of knew that you wanted to go well, there. Well, I I it, this I had a very close knit group of friends through junior high and high school, and we just all sort of well we knew we were not society girls. So OU was not the place for us, and we were all serious students. And we decided that that was a better place for girls who were middle class income and who were going to have to work if we went to school. And uh, we decided that's where we wanted to go. And just suddenly, that's where we were all going. And we did, mm -hmm. all except Pam. She went to OCU because she was pre-med and has become a doctor. Well, who were who were your other friends? Mary Kay Lilly, mm -hmm. who was a and Joe Francis Rawling, Marjorie Yetman, and I guess the, those were the ones of us that went from that senior class, and then uh, yeah, because Betty Ingram went to OU and Pam went to OCU. So. And what was Pam's last name? Prentice. Okay. So you had a group, you, you, you basically had a built-in group of uh -huh. friends going yeah. there. Yeah. What was the transition like when you got to Stillwater? Because you would have been coming from Oklahoma City to Stillwater, which must have been, even though there were a number of students there, it must have been a bit of a shock. <laughs> it's sort of a cultural <laughs> shock. Well, but it made blending in, you know, living in a dormitory with 500 girls was no problem. We'd been used to and 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 we had always had all through high school we had an english teacher a math teacher a science teacher so we were accustomed to that we had had four hour exams all the way through high school so we were accustomed to that in fact as i said you enrolled in what would be a preparatory classes college preparatory course when you enroll at Classen, if you didn't plan to do that, you enrolled in business education. Everybody took the same core classes, but your electives and the extra ones, uh, like the girls who were going to business college took business English. We took standardized or and classical English and classical literature. Uh, we took extra classes like that the kids who were going to go to business college took shorthand and business math and business English and think but we were still in the same school but we'd had psychology and four years of foreign language and a couple of years of science and as I said four hour exams and we were uh, physical education was available and I took that every year because I liked it and uh, but those were electives and you, but you had to take you had to take so many hours of science so many of math so many and everybody had to take four years of english but after the sophomore year the other two were like classical english and the kids who were going to business college took business english and learned how to write business letters and stuff actually the kids out in that business to, almost got out of school ready to go to work and lots of them did. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that uh, you'd always wanted to go into education but when we were talking earlier you said that originally when you got to OSU you didn't enroll in the College of Ed. No I enrolled in the College of Business because my mother told me I had to but I didn't take any business courses. I only took the core courses and what I needed for education because I'd already had a catalog that summer and decided what I was going to take. So you knew? I, I knew what I was doing. I just did it. I, I did what my mother told me, but I did it my way. <laughs> <laughs> With Within your classes, were there any particular class, uh, any, any particular courses that you recall being influential for you? Uh, well, probably the humanities program, because it was so fantastic then. It was a four-hour course, and you had four hours of lectures, which would take every facet of civilization in order and explain the uh, government, 
the language, the customs, the literature, and the art, and the specialists in the university, or in the college then, uh, would come in and do the guest lectures. And then you had an English lab, which uh, you wrote themes and took tests and stuff that had to do with the period of history that you'd been studying. It was historical as well as literature, and it was fabulous. The art teacher came and spoke to us. Dole Reed was the uh, art teacher at the time, and uh, I, I was trying to remember the professor's name who did the government because he was Dr. Hillis because he was just fascinating. He just, he just made the governments of all those different periods of history come alive. And uh, then uh, the head of the art department, Bo, what was Bo's name then? He had the band there at Stillwater. His first, um, that was the, his, it wasn't the first name, but it was the nickname that they used. But anyway, who was the band director? And he would talk to us about music, Gladys Dunkelberger, talked to us about vocal music and uh, and about and each time that you hit a period in history their lectures were relegated to that particular period of history so it was history and English English composition music education all in one it, it was and it was a four-hour course, and you took two semesters of it, and it was required if you were in the School of Education. There was no... So it was very holistic. Yeah, but it was great. Mm -hmm. I loved it. We worked ourselves to death, but it, the information was so great. And you mentioned a number of professors. Were there others that you became close to either through any of your work I or I liked Dr. Hill a great deal that I had he was my, ended up being my advisor after they threw me out of the School of Business. And he was a psychology professor and I really liked him. And as I said, my dad had been killed in an almost the year I was a senior and he found that out and he just sort of he didn't really take over the thing of a father except that if I needed male advice I knew I could go to him mm -hmm. and he always made time for his students along with his classes he was everybody liked having him for an advisor mm -hmm. yeah was, that would have been a tough transition to make I mean getting to the end of high school with everything else going on at the same time because it was in February of my senior year that dad was killed and so I you know I just so yeah, it was wonderful to find a professor that would be like that. It that would have been the tail end of the depression too. Did oh, you yeah. have trouble getting jobs at well, the university? Well, I or? I didn't because I had a friend. Otis Sullivan was the political writer for the Daily Oklahoman at that time, and the Sullivans and my family had been friends forever. In fact. His oldest brother had been my dad's business partner, and and he was the political reporter for a long time for the Daily Oklahoma, and he knew really well the man who was head of the employment thing at Stillwater, and he called him and gave me a note, and I got a job when some kids didn't, because it was in the dining hall. It wasn't it wasn't a fancy job. I washed dishes and set tables and. Mm -hmm. Uh, weighted tables and but it was there it was in the dorm it was secure uh, my salary I never saw because it went in to pay my room and board mm -hmm. so and then the next three years I was a counselor uh, a proctor not a counselor a proctor which we counted noses because freshmen had to be in by 745 we had room check at 8 o'clock, which was our job as counselors, and then room check again at 10. And then we met with the house mother, and you wrote down if you had somebody that was in somebody else's room, their name and room number, so that we accounted for every single girl every night. Do you remember who the house mother's or house mother yes. was for Murray when you were there? Yeah, uh, and I had her name a minute ago. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mother Latimer, <laughs> L-A-T-I-M-E-R, and and you know she did such a wonderful job 
and she did such a good job of making the girls who lived in the dorms feel as equally pampered as the girls in the sorority houses. Because like in the winter, when it, we had a formal tea every Thursday afternoon in the blue room, and uh, it was just there, and girls took turns serving and stuff, and we always had a big dance. We did house decorations just like the sororities did. Mm -hmm. So it was, we never felt bad. What, what was Murray Hall like when you were there? Well, it was reasonably new then, and we thought it was wonderful. And North had been added to it. And then the dorm across the street uh, from it. Willard? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was built while I was, and then opened while I was still there. And, but Murray was the girls' dorm when I went, Murray and North. Have you been back since they've renovated it? No, I haven't. It's been quite a while. Uh, I went back, I don't think I've been back since Sill died, and he's been dead 20 years, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. But uh, You should come back. They've done a gorgeous job. It's it's all offices and everything yeah. now, but they still have the lounge on the first floor. Well, there. and that's such a, you know, actually, our lounge and the little blue room lounge and stuff were nicer than the sorority houses. Our rooms were bigger and there were only two girls in it. And you weren't far from Theta Pond? No, across the street. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what was, what was Theta Pond like when you were there? Uh, very much like it is now. It's more elaborate now, or it was the last time I was there. And, uh, I guess I was there about 15 years ago because we did go to CK after she moved there, okay. after she moved back. I forgot Pam and I, the one that's the doctor in Oklahoma City. So, and we drove around the campus and, you know, picked Pam up and went to lunch. And, uh, and uh, so, but uh, we haven't been back because Mary Kay's, uh, unfortunately, her Alzheimer's has mm -hmm. this. It has progressed so much that the last time we were there, we weren't even sure that she she would have moments of knowing us. And we decided that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but the theta was you know the same, and we had to dress for dinner. We had to wear dresses and hose for dinner at night. Was there a dress code for the library when you were there? Well, sort of, because the library was much smaller. That wonderful new library that's there now, and the student union was non-existent. SWIMS was the, <laughs> that was the student union. <laughs> that was the other thing I was going to ask. What were the student hangouts? When SWIMS, mm -hmm. and then, the, then over on the other side of the campus, there was a drugstore, too. Mm -hmm. But SWIMS was the hangout, and the chili bowl. And, but uh, that's, swims was where you went, that was. The place to go on a Friday or Saturday. Yeah, or if you had a break in the, you know. Mm -hmm. and, it's where everybody hung out. Well, it's like when we were being, uh, when we were pledges in Aggie Ed's, mm -hmm. uh, during Hell Week we had to go in three times a day and get down on our hands and knees and go like this in front of the mirror and say, slap her to the switch a lama gator. <laughs> And you still remember that all these years later. Well, yeah, you do it. I guess well. something like that you would. I, I remember that better than some of the other things. Down on your hands and knees in, in, the, in the hangout of the university, of the college. And Why don't you talk a little bit about the Aggie Eds? I know you were involved with okay, them. Okay, it was... Uh, uh, there were two pep clubs, but the, it was the, plep, the girls' pep club, and you had to make application and be accepted. And fortunately, the bunch of us that came from uh, Oklahoma City did, all three of us ended up. We wore black pleated skirts that came down below our knees, white shirts, and our jackets were like a letterman's jacket, only black with orange sleeves and then the insignia on it, and uh, saddle oxfords. You had to wear saddle oxfords. No choice. You wore saddle oxfords and white socks. And uh, going to games was required, but I don't remember anybody ever fussing about it. That's what you did, whether it was basketball or 
football or uh, baseball, that's where the pep club belonged, you know. And we just did, and we sat together, and Miss Hewlett, yeah. No, that's my high school PE teacher. Uh, what was, oh. Colvin? Yes. Uh, Miss Colvin? Yes. Val Valerie Colvin? I yes, think. Valerie Colvin was our sponsor. And uh, firm as she, I mean, that was, and we behaved, believe you me. And we wore our uniforms the way they were supposed to be worn. Some days we almost died in that heavy wool jacket. The first couple of football games, they would let us just wear our white shirts. But then as it got cooler, you that's what you wore. And the cheerleaders had white pleated skirts that came down below your knees, and you wore hose. And then we could wear anklets with our saddle oxfords because they looked better. But Miss mm -hmm. I mean, Miss Collin thought we needed stockings so we didn't look so. Which, when you think about what cheerleaders look like now, <laughs> and uh, but the cheerleaders' outfits were white, and the skirt was white, white sweater with a black O on it, black and orange O on it. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, it had. Now then, those girls would laugh their heads off at what we did. Probably the biggest thing we did was get down on one knee and go like this. We did turn a, well, we didn't turn any cartwheels because you didn't have anything on enough underneath it, but. Uh, well, what, how did you get interested in the Aggieettes in the first place? Well, I had, at, at Classen, uh, the pep clubs had been really important and we got up there and I thought I'm going to apply for that that would be fun and uh, it was not you didn't have to try out or anything for the pep club because all you did was sit up in the stands and yell and march in and ride a bus if you were lucky to go to an out-of-town game and that was probably twice a year and since nobody had cars we didn't go to the out-of-town girls and this was just at the edge of the depression and most of the kids there at school were working and nobody was allowed to have cars so well and and your time in school covered a really important historical period because it was the end of the depression but pearl harbor happened while you were while in i was in school yes what do you remember about being on campus during that oh time? i had been to church early and come home and i was upstairs in the dorm and Somebody had a rate. We had been doing a conga line up and down the hall, which was not unusual. And somebody had a radio on and heard about the bombing and came flying out in the hall and told us. And this, this I will never forget it. One of the girls had a record which I've never been able to find, and I it's not except. For what it was, it was called Gloomy Sunday. And she immediately put that on and turned it up real loud in that, and it was the third floor of Mary Hall. I know exactly where I was. And they, uh, the words were something like, darling, the hours I live, lie, live with are slumberless. And about now that the long dark night has taken you away, it was the most morbid. Gloomy as Sunday, the hours are numberless, darling. The little hours I live with are slumberless. And I don't remember any of the rest of it, but it got worse. I remember that. And uh, and there were. Then we found out there was one girl in the dorm whose brother had been killed in Pearl Harbor. So as I remember, we had a memorial, Mother Latimer. And we had a slight, a small memorial service in that wonderful big living room for her brother, and lots of us knew people who uh, had been in service because they had already been drafting, and uh, the waves ended up on our campus, which we resented intensely. And, I would think about that often when I got in service about the fact that I had uh, been so intolerant of the. Well, the thing we didn't like about them was the boys were dating them. 
But then after they brought some boys in, some young men in service, and put them in the barracks, we felt a little better about the waves because it was being reversed. I but, was going to ask about that. They had some special training schools there. Uh -huh. What do you remember of those? And Well, I remember that the waves took over Murray Hall, mm -hmm. uh, North Murray, mm -hmm. and those girls all had to move in with us, so we ended up, some of it, three girls to, and we really were not as nice as we might have been, and I thought, well, I paid for that when I got in service. And uh, then when the boys got on the campus and were there, then the thing the girls hadn't liked was here were these college boys dating those waves who didn't have any business on our campus. <laughs> and we'd had, you know, we'd had to double up in the, our rooms in the dorm and we sort of resented that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we were talking a little bit about how, how the social life well, and the think, demographics yeah. changed. Yeah, well, but it, but it evened out because the military boys would ask the civilian girls, so there were plenty of boys again, even though some of ours had been drafted, you know. And so I guess it, it just sort of smooth. And we became more aware of how serious the war was, too. I'm sure that had something to do with it. Mm -hmm. And then I said Dr. Hill ended up being called up because he'd been a reserve officer, and he came back recruiting to the, and he had been my advisor for a while and he said I think you need to really check into this and I sort of you know we talked about it some but I didn't put much precedence in it till I got home and I'd been home three or four weeks this is after graduation uh -huh. because we got out you know about in the middle of May and I went home and went to work in the ophthalmologist's office and just, well, the recruiting office was across the street and I said, I'll go see about it and I ended up being sworn in before I left. Yeah. Well, what I, I, I guess, um, before before we go on to, the, on to your time in yeah. the service, let's, let's finish up okay. just a little bit with with OSU, but do you, you, you talked about um, being involved in the Aggieettes. Yeah. And you were also involved in sports. Yeah. Um, with the Women's Athletic Association. And, Is that and I, I played, uh, I was on the volleyball team and the lacrosse team mm -hmm. and field hockey. Because I played field hockey in high school and most of the girls hadn't, but I had, so. That we were, and, and Marjorie Yetman had the, one of the other girls from OSU, from a class, and then we, and we'd all already had it, so we were a little ahead, you know. Mm -hmm. so. Were those varsity teams uh -huh. at that yeah. point? And did you, what other universities, or what other colleges well, did you Well, OU came, play? and we played them, and uh, Tulsa. University came, and that's really odd. I there wasn't a whole lot. I, we'd had more games in high school actually, because we not only played Oklahoma City high schools, but the surrounding ones. In the so actually, we played more intramural games after I got to in high school than I did in college. But we did play, and and. Was there a fair amount of support? Yeah, 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 they, yeah. Not like there is now, but there, there would be a few. But never in those days did girls. I mean, it was this. Those girls were playing sports, and you, you wanted, you had to want to do it. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get uh, negative feedback? I guess from no. Okay. If we did, I don't remember it because it was. And I enjoyed it so much that, no, I don't remember ever having any kind of negative feedback about it. And our uh, uniforms were so... Finally, our last, I was that our junior and senior year, or just the senior year that, it seems like it was just the senior year that instead of those romper things that girl, we ended up with khaki shorts and and dark brown shirts and we thought we'd died and gone to heaven because they were 
so much better. And in fact, I wore mine till they wore out after. And uh, but uh, they were much better looking than those romper things that we had. Were were the phys ed folks your coaches for those? sports or did you have different coaches do you remember uh let's see there's i just remember miss calvin she's i don't know whether whether she was the, i think she must have been the only one because i did archery some archery and uh then volleyball and field hockey and some lacrosse. We didn't do as much lacrosse because there was, but she, apparently she had had it when she went to college and, and we all liked it. It was different and fun and, and you know, when you're in college, if you're taking more physical education than you have to, you're doing it because you want to. Because it's not an elective most girls pick out. Right, and did you have a chance to get jackets or pins or anything mm -mm. like that? No. Oh, goodness, no. Not the girls. <laughs> just checking. <laughs> so I, I guess we'll just finish up with a, a few extra questions of, about OSU. But um, is, is there a place on campus, you mentioned Murray Hall, but is there another place on campus, campus that's really special to you, or would you say Murray Hall's? Murray and maybe the, I was trying to, what was the name of the building? Well, there was uh, Old Central, which is still there, isn't it? It better be. And then there was where we had those humanities classes. There was a big auditorium and a small one. And it was up close to, well, close to swims, up on that end of the campus but I can't remember the name of it but the but our humanities class was great big except for the labs that I told you about and we all met in that one auditorium and they had small the uh, fine arts department would put on small productions in there and uh, so the moral equivalent of the Seratine Center uh -huh, now yeah mm -hmm. okay and and just finally have, have you remained connected to OSU at all? I mean, do you follow the... Oh, I follow the games a lot. And when Syl was alive, we went to quite a few of the games because he was a real sports addict. And we had uh, a good... Some friends that, that were a couple that... Uh, Dick Kruger had been uh, a basketball star there when we were all Americans all the time, when OSU went, was in its glory, when uh, in its basketball, we were always national champions, <laughs> you know. And we, we never expected to lose a basketball game, and I guess that's why it didn't, wasn't as important if we didn't win all the football games, because basketball was the sport and Henry Iba was the coach, and the games were good, and and a lot of the basketball game players, you know, went on. Well, Gene Smeltzer was there when I was there, and uh, and I he'd gone to high school where I did, so, and Bob Curlin, the first big tall boy, and he was tall, and. So you became a basketball basketball fan for life at that point. Yeah, well, I'd be, and I'd been a basketball fan mm -hmm. in high school because Classen's main sport was basketball. We were pretty good at football, but we were whizzes at basketball. So it was a natural fit yeah, for OSU. Yeah, it was no, it was no problem for me to be a basketball fan, and I still like it. <laughs> well, there's a lot to watch with basketball. Yeah. Well, and I was really nearsighted, and I, you can see everything better. Mm -hmm. So how, how would you say attending OSU impacted your life? Uh, it gave me more confidence than anything I think that ever happened in my life, because I did have to work, but I was allowed to. And, we, and the girls who worked, there was no stigma on it. And I gained a great deal of self-confidence because I said my dad having been killed and it gave me the four years of being on my own but being sheltered. 
So a good launching pad. Yes. It it really was. It was, and I came out. You know, I felt good about myself. And uh, yeah, I would say it probably had more impact on my life than almost anything I did, really. Well, and it obviously uh, other than getting married, and <laughs> you know, but I mean, of my formative years, mm -hmm. and and because I was able to always have a job there, and there was no stigma attached to working. An awful lot of the kids did it, at, at, and so you did. And well, it obviously gave you enough confidence to sign up for the service. Uh huh. And I met the man who, you know, he was my professor and my uh, sponsor while I was in high school. I mean, in college, and so I had faith in what he told me when he said, "I think you need to look into this." It might be exactly what you would like to have. Mm -hmm. And he said, are you engaged or anything? And I said, no. And he said, I didn't think you would be. You're having too much fun. <laughs> and I was. I had a great time. As hard as I worked, and sometimes I had two or three jobs, but I had lots of fun. That's good. Well, why don't, why don't you talk about your transition into the, into the service okay. after you graduated? Well, I uh, said... Uh, Dr. Hill had been there as a recruiting officer, and I had talked to him, and he first piqued my entrance, and we'd had the, the waves on the campus, and I'd seen women in action in service. And I had come home in, in the spring, and I had gotten a job with uh, Dr. Shaver, and the, there were three uh, doctors in the office, and they were... Uh, eye, nose, and throat specialist, and uh, Dr. Shaver's son is one of the ophthalmologists here now in town, which is his grandson, he's the grandson, and I, he's the one I go to and I'd work for him. But uh, I went to work there and I was comfortable and, and it was just, you know, I had applied for teaching, but that was still early in June and they certainly hadn't started hiring. And I just, it just seemed like the right thing to do. And as I said, they had kept talking about if women would enlist, then maybe fathers wouldn't have to go. And having spent part of my lifetime without a father, I knew how important that was. And I couldn't imagine not having one early on. It was bad enough to not have one from high school on. And so I just enlisted. And I put down, because I'd had all those hours of psychology, when they said, what would you like to do? I put down cadre, which is, do uh, you know what cadre is? But why don't you, for people okay. who... It, it, the okay, the cadre meant the people who trained you. It was a training situation, so it was not too far from my teaching. And because I'd had all the extra psychology, I thought that would help, too. And little did I know that because of one two-hour course that I took to finish out the year that I would end up in, uh, after I finished basic training, going to photography school, which was the great, in uh, Denver at Lowry Field, which was the greatest thing that could have happened to me because it just opened up a world. But basic training in Florida in the summer with no air conditioning was Horrible. You were wringing wet. We had a close order drill for an hour every morning in the sun. We had PT, which is like a gym class, and until you've done push-ups in the sand with the sand fleas chewing on your ankles, it was so. Uh, basic training is rough. It's meant to be, and it's meant to wash people out who are not good material. So it's okay. But it is difficult, and and it was more difficult because of the climate, and the, and I had hoped to go to New York, and but then I went to Lowry to school to fo more photo school, and that was interesting. I learned all kinds of new things that I had no idea about the extents that cameras could be or how to develop and print, and it was so different then, and then learned about aerial photography, and. Uh, if when you do, the rolls of films were 
360 exposures long and each print was 10 by 10. And planes in that time, I don't know whether they still do or not, did trimetric on photography, which meant there was one vertical and a right and left oblique camera. And they took pictures from horizon to horizon. And when you knew young men had risked their lives and some had died to get the film, you were very careful. And uh, to, uh, to develop the film, you had to put it in a canister thing, like an ice cream freezer is the best. It went down and it was in the developer and then it would go through a wash and then over to the second half and do the hypo which set it. But these rolls were like, well, to hold a 10 by 10 inch and a roll of film that was 360 of those, they were big. The printers were at least as big as the top of that table, so what? About two by three, yeah. maybe? And, uh, and they were done with lights underneath. There were 24 white lights and four blue lights that you used, and you snapped those lights on to till the print looked right. Mm -hmm so that you could see through it and sometimes you were not only going through the film but through flack where the boys had shot and it would trace when they could either come in and just reconnaissance the land or if they were on a bombing mission you could see the bomb drop and trace it from the time it left the belly of the plane until it hit the ground and then sometimes you were lucky enough even to get the ones that came behind for the same but you could see, absolutely see the, all the devastation that was there and uh, at corners of the buildings and things like that. And well, when did you, let's see, you, you graduated in 1943. Uh -huh. So you went to Florida and where, where in Florida were you? Daytona. Okay. Um, so you went to Florida then for basic and that would have been six weeks? Yeah. And then to Lowry? And then to Lowry. Okay. And was there until the middle of September, sometime in September. Okay, so that, okay, in 43? No, I was, yeah, I was in, at, at, at early September, I went to, to Lowry. Okay. Because we, I, I got into, uh, after I finished that, uh, that flower time, it, uh, that, uh, all in there, uh, we went to, uh, I, I ended up going to Spokane, mm -hmm. to Feltz Field, and that was the second photo mapping squadron, was the name of that outfit. And the boys were mapping the Kuril Islands, and we did the lab work again on developing the film and printing what they had done because that was the time in history when we thought the Russians were going to join the Japanese and that they would come over the Kuril Islands. So we were mapping them and, and able then to shut them off so that they couldn't. Actually, those films blocked, because of the information they got, blocked their ability to come across the Kuril Islands. So, and then from there, I went, uh, to Peterson Field, and we did a lot more. And I was there, well, one of the main things I remember was being there sitting on the floor in one of the labs when the French, the, when we invaded the French coast, and and we did pictures from that. Oh, wow. And then it wasn't long after the boys left Peterson Field, though, that's when I went for one month to uh, March Field in just out of Los Angeles, just on a special assignment, and then back to staging in Denver. And then I was sent to, to the Pentagon when they did a new thing. I ended up, that's when I ended up going to the Pentagon where I did most of the so about what what time do you think it would have been when you ended up at the Pentagon? Mm, it was cold, I don't remember that. Oh, it was New Year's Eve. Oh, okay. <laughs> mm. 
New yeah. Year's Eve, New Year's Eve in the Pentagon. <laughs> well, um, so you you actually got to see quite a bit. Oh yeah, I did. Of the it was wonderful. At that point. And then I was until the next November. I was in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. and uh, there were even though we worked long shifts and stuff and lived in sort of primitive barracks, the ink would freeze in your foot locker and uh, it was hot and it wasn't any, but the Pentagon was air conditioned. So we had an air conditioned. And we could either go down and get a boat and ride across the Potomac and get on those army military trucks, just like you see the troop trucks now. Mm -hmm. They've changed very little. Or they had a bus that picked us up outside the mess hall that they had converted horse trailers and put sides down the horse trailers and they would take us to the Pentagon and we would work and then come home the same way and of course there were all the normal things there were to do. Uh, uh, NCO clubs were lots of fun because everybody was welcome, you know, and uh, if you were not an officer, there was a place to go, and usually a bunch of you went together from the barracks, but if not, when you got there, there was going to be a table of somebody that you knew. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like a college campus, really, in that part of it. And then in Washington, D.C., there were so many wonderful things, at least for me, to see, like the national buildings, and the Art Institute, and Mellon, Mellon Art Institute was wonderful then. And they had a concert of some kind every single Sunday afternoon in one of the open areas, the fountain something. And uh, it, was, it was wonderful music, great artists, you know, that I would, in Oklahoma didn't get to see because they don't they didn't travel around all over the United States like they do now and the art galleries and the botanical gardens and the federal buildings and we could get in places in our uniforms that other people couldn't and I, I was wondering I mean during wartime how much of DC was sort of off limits to civilians quite a bit of it I imagine of course the things like the Art Institute and stuff weren't, but uh, but we could get into the other buildings when and now the the libraries, the national libraries were still open, and the museum there in Washington that's on the oh the Smithsonian yeah the Smithsonian it was much smaller. The last time I was there, I couldn't believe how it had grown. I should have known, but I just wasn't quite prepared for it. And I'd been back once because I'd taken Ginger back when she finished Girl State and so it was it was just it was fun. It was just and and seeing all those there were such wonderful things there. And like if if we had the weekend off we could go up to Mount Vernon or uh, and to go to the National Cemetery and watch the changing of the guard there is the most, to this day, even when I took my kids back to see that, that's one of the most inspiring things that I can still get goose pimples that when they changed the guard. At the yeah. Um, what was, I, I, I guess, you know, you'd, you'd grown up in an in an urban area with Oklahoma City. Yeah. It wasn't the size it is now, but it no. was still a large Yes, it was a, a lot bigger city. than lots of the kids were. Of course, right. we had kids from New York City, too, mm -hmm. who were very used to this space. But you must it, you must have been pretty independent to be... You must, you must have had a, a pretty good sense of self-confidence to be wandering around. Well, I think DC. I did. Mm -hmm. I, I, and, and, of course, you always had a buddy with you. Mm -hmm. You just did that. And I had been stationed at Denver, which was pretty good size. Mm -hmm. uh, and Daytona wasn't. It was really small then. But, but Denver was uh, a good size city then, but not in comparison to Washington. But again, things are so well located in Washington, and it's so easy to find your way. And there was you know, always, it's harder now. The last time I was there, the 
public transportation, I thought, my gosh, we used to just get on and go every place, and now I'm almost afraid to get in here. But well, what, what was the situation for you? I mean, you were working at the Pentagon and staying in the barracks, uh -huh. but did you have to get leave passes if you wanted to go away someplace for the weekend, or was it more that was the housing that you had well, for a regular and only job? If you had a, only if you, we could leave and come back, but we had to be back by midnight, okay. unless you had a weekend pass or, or a furlough or something. But yes, we had to be back just like we were in college. Okay. And, and we had to be in every night. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but we could still go any place in the Washington area. Mm -hmm. And all you had to do was show your ID as you left the field and, and show it when you came back in, if you went before, before midnight. Now, if you got back at midnight, you might have a little trouble getting back on the field. It depended on who was the officer of the day at that, <laughs> whether how strict he was. Um, and, and were the curfews different for the women than they were for the men? Uh, Do you know? I don't, I don't think they were. I don't remember them being any different okay. because everybody had to be in you still had to get up for the next morning. Yeah, uh -huh. and and it's as far as I know, I know I know there I know that at Peterson Field and at Feltz Field, the boys had to be in as soon as we did. Okay, and I don't remember about Bowling Field because it was so big and we were such a little part of it. We had two barracks that worked in the photo lab. And we were with them. And then other people worked every place all over Washington. It was a real a billeting field, and that mm -hmm. makes and people worked shifts all the time. Sometimes we'd even work a night shift, but we went on transportation that they picked you up and you came home. And we did have bed check. I do remember that. And if we were just out running around, we had to be back in by midnight. But if our whole barracks, you know, was out and we all came home at the same time, well, but yeah, you had to be there and you had to stand inspection even after we got some place like Bowling Field in. You still had to do that. Mm -hmm. So what kind of work did you, I mean, you, you were working uh, with the phot photographic uh -huh, always. Uh, unit. At, at the Pentagon. Yeah. Um, what were some of the things that you saw? I mean, you mentioned some of the some of the footage that you'd see. From well, it, it was bombing primarily. It was reconnaissance or mapping. Sometimes it was they would go in and fly over, do a flyover, and we would do the map, and then they would get the information, and from there they would go back and schedule the bombing runs. So it was both kinds. Mm -hmm both preparation and reconnaissance. So there would be times when there was a lot of time pressure on, on oh, some yeah. of the things that you Oh, anything that was reconnaissance was, mm -hmm. yes, and, and you stayed till you finished. That's just, but you didn't think anything about it because it was wartime, and in World War II, everybody pulled together. There was such solidarity. What was the most striking thing you remember seeing? developing all of that film? Well, probably the stuff out of the Enola Gay because it was the most damage. The others we would see pieces of buildings and stuff, not just, I mean, we were looking at, there, there's a tree, oh, there is a tree, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it was, but it was all, every single one of it was because well, maybe there would be a beautiful church that half of it had been bombed out in the picture. So it, it would be hard to say mm -hmm. because every single one of them, and every single one meant something or they wouldn't have wasted the film or the flyover to do it. Mm -hmm. So you did, you did end up developing some of the film from the Enola Gay. Yes, and, and you felt... Uh, every single thing that you got that you knew how the boys 
when you have to burn through the flak and you know those kids are being shot at to get those films, they're important. Mm -hmm. Because no matter what the situation was, if a boy lost his life, he was still an American soldier. And so, so you were very careful what you did with the film, and you did your best to get the very best information for the intelligence officers that you could, and that's what it was used for. So how long did you work at the Pentagon? Uh, I was there from December until the next November. Okay. I was trying to think one night. But yeah, it was just not quite one year, but... And where did you go after that? I, oh, I you, came, you came home, came yeah. On. Came home to Oklahoma City and mm -hmm. I taught, I, well I got home in November and the first of January I started to work teaching at uh, Stan Wadey in Oklahoma City and uh, then the next, that next fall I got married and we moved up here because Sil's job was here mm -hmm. at the dealership, at the Chevrolet dealership. That must have been a transition. When I moved to Edmond? I'd grown up in Oklahoma City, which was a city. I'd been in Denver, I'd been in Spokane, I'd been in Washington, D.C., and we moved up here and the sign says, Welcome to Edmond, population 2003. And I thought, what have, because Syl kept saying, now honey, if you'd rather, we'll find a place to live in Oklahoma City, if you'd rather. But his job was here and I knew it was going to be permanent. My brother-in-law owned the dealership and he and Syl had been good friends for a long time. In fact, that was probably one of the reasons I ended up having the first date with him was because he, and, and then he was my best friend's uncle. And, uh, and I'd been crazy about him anyway. And so uh, we moved up here and he worked for the Chevrolet dealership until he retired from the time we moved here. And we lived in an apartment which is over, it was a, a house, Professor Oak's house, and it's on the corner of 2nd and, uh, 2nd and University. It, it used to be 2nd and College, and I couldn't think what it was called now, which is a, it, just because the college changed to you know, And that house is gone now. We lived there about maybe four months, and Custer Service built couple of new houses up on 11th Street, which was practically out of the city limits. And there were only three houses on the street and still bought one of them and we moved in and it was a little brand new house, which was fun. And, but we hadn't been married quite a year when we bought that house. And so we lived there until we built this one. And so, you know, I grew up in one house in Oklahoma City and two in, in Edmond. And okay, so we were talking about the end of your service and, and you got out at the end of the war uh -huh. and you were all just discharged at uh -huh. the end of the war? Yeah. Were there any benefits that you folks got the way the men did in terms of GI Bill? Or Not for like a while, that? but eventually, before long, yeah, because we used sills for one house and mine for the other to buy the houses. Okay. And so that was, uh, and of course, and uh, like I still have my GI insurance, it's paid up. We had to switch it and make it paid up insurance, but I still have that. And, mm -hmm. and I, could use the, I could use the medical facilities. I don't choose to. And anybody that's done Army medicine would tell you why. And uh, so, now, how you mentioned that your your husband was uh, almost eleven years old, right? Almost. And was the uncle of a friend of yours. But how how did you end up meeting? I mean, how how did you end up? How did I meet him? Well, how did you meet him first? But how did you start going out? Then I guess I did just when I got home from service, and he had gotten home, and of course I was grown then. I mm -hmm. you know, and. Uh, he and my brother-in-law were good friends, 
and his, as I said, he was my best friend's young uncle, and uh, her parents and Awana and Chet, my brother-in-law and sister, were the same age, because my sister was 11 years older than I was. And so uh, they would go places, and Syl and I both just gotten home, and he would say, oh, they're going someplace, honey, and if you'd like to go, uh, well, and first of all, the first month we were both home, I worked in the office for Chet with license tags because he suddenly got the tag bureau and it used to just be one month a year. And Syl and I came from Oklahoma City and we just, well, and we rode the inner urban back and forth up here to work. Was he was in the body shop and I was working in the office for Chet before I got the job at Stan Wadey. And he lived on 32nd and I lived on 33rd. So we get off the inner urban and uh, then he'd say, how about we go to a movie, you know? And I was so thrilled because I had not uh, been aware of what, uh, you know, that he was, I just thought he was being nice to me because he was Betty's uncle, but I knew how I felt. <laughs> and uh, then we were riding home on the inner urban one night and we were talking about cooking, and I said, well, I knew, he was asking me, and I said something about I knew how to make cornbread, but I never learned how to make biscuits because Mother always did that. And he says, well, if we're going to get married, you better learn how to make biscuits, and that was <laughs> And so then we got married the next, but we waited until the next September. We both decided, and, you know, and we did a lot of running around and a lot of things together, and uh, then I went to in this. I went to work at Stan Wadey in Oklahoma City, and he, of course, that was a permanent job for him, and he knew it was. But the thing that I was doing for my brother-in-law was just going to last a month, and I knew that. But it gave me an interim thing to do, and I liked being up here. My sister was next door, and so, it, it, and so we got married the next September. And you ended up in Edmond. Uh -huh. <laughs> because that's where he was working, and he did not, it took him a long time before it was okay for me to work. He thought it was his job was to take care of me, which was pretty nice. And all the time he kept saying, you know, you don't have to work. If I hadn't thought I could take care of you, I wouldn't have married you. Where had he been? Uh, was he in the Navy or the Army? In the Seabees. Oh, in the Seabees. Uh -huh. okay. In the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Was it tough for him? I mean, for either one of you? I mean, making that transition from... Oh, some, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he'd been in the National Guard earlier when he was younger, so he knew more about military life than mm -hmm. I did. So. But I, I was thinking more the transition coming back. back. I don't think it was very hard for either one of us. Mm -hmm. I don't remember it being... I, the, the biggest thing I had trouble with was when people said they would do something and then they didn't. Because I had been accustomed those years in service that you had to do what you were supposed to do. But you get over that. Yeah. But uh, that's, we ended up, and of course, we have moved into a set of friends because my sister and I were so close, even though we were years apart, and he and Chet, so we ended up with their friends being our friends. And uh, so we didn't have to make friends in a new town, and we both still had friends in Oklahoma City, too. And you weren't that far. No. And I could ride the, you couldn't get cars or gas, you know, you could get gasoline, but not cars. But I could ride the inner urban. For 25 cents, I could ride downtown to Oklahoma City and get off, shop and do something and get back on and get off right up on Broadway. And that's when we lived in that little house on 11th and it wasn't a half a block from where I could get off the inner urban, which was, and I didn't have to pay parking fee. So as long as the inner urban ran, even though we had a car, I didn't take it to Oklahoma City if I was going downtown. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you said you worked at Stan Wadey mm -hmm. um, in Oklahoma City uh -huh. that, starting that January, so that would have been January of 46? 
Yeah. Okay. Until the semester ended, till mm -hmm. May. And then you got married. Uh huh. And I didn't work September. at all for a while. Okay. And then pretty soon I did start. Well, I didn't. I didn't. I started subbing when Ginger was in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So and it when was, was she born? Uh, fifty. Let's see. Mike was born in forty nine. Okay. Fifty two. Okay. The end of fifty two. Almost. Okay. And and she was five years later. So, I I started subbing when she started to kindergarten, because they were in a real bind one night, and Leona Kennedy was where, and she says, "Sil, why don't you let Jerry sub? That way she can keep her certificate, and I really need her." And she had to get the subs for all the grade schools in town, and. So, well, it, she'd started to kindergarten, so it worked out, and Fern uh, had a little girl, and she lived across the street, and she played at the church, and she also played for funerals at the funeral homes here in town. So we swapped off. She would take care of Ginger till I got home, and if she had a funeral, in the afternoon, which is when most of them were then, I took care of the girls. And then again, all summer, I could take care of, and then the girls started to school in first grade, so they were both taken care of. And and then I didn't, but I didn't teach star, I didn't teach full time until Ginger started to junior high. But often I taught two or three months in a grade because then when young women were pregnant before they were six months pregnant they had to they had to quit and they had to stay out three months after the which really was a good thing it's uh, certainly that three months bonding time and the school had to recognize them and had to hold their jobs for them but they wouldn't let them in the classroom because it wasn't decent for pregnant women to be. Now they teach till the day they have the baby, you know, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Well, when did you start teaching full time? You you told me a little story before we started okay, recording start, about I, about how you ended up in the sixth grade. I, I started <laughs> teaching the year Ginger started to junior high, so she would have been twelve years old. Mm -hmm. And you had said that there was this job that you were really interested at, in. At Plagern, because that's where my kids had gone to school, and it was the old, it was not the oldest school, but it was by far the neatest, and I had all the professors and the lawyers and the kids, that, that's where those kids went to school. And I knew their parents, and uh, so I, I kept saying, and he said, well, there's one at Ida Freeman. I said, I'm not going over there and teach full time. I don't have to go to work. If I can't have this job at Cleggern, I'll just sub. And he's funny. He said, you really mean that, don't you? And I said, yeah, I do. I said, well, that's where I want to teach. And so I taught there until Syl retired. And this was the the uh, principal for the school? Uh, no, was, superintendent. Oh, the superintendent. What yeah. was his name? Uh, Dr. Cornelison. He lived down here at the end of the block. But he gave me the worst time about that. And Dr. Alcorn from the college said, I hear you're going to be Phoebe's sixth grade teacher. And I said, how did you hear that? I haven't heard it yet. And he says, hadn't he told you, well, you've got that job. He said, all of us know it. <laughs> <laughs> but we were neighbors, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was this very small town. And I knew those kids' parents were going to back me up and that... And I loved it. I loved teaching sixth grade. But the year I quit uh, was the year they, they took the sixth grade out of grade schools and put it into the middle school. So that made it a little easier. And Syl was retiring, and we did an awful lot of running around. We went to South Texas, and we went to Corpus for a month, and, uh, you know, and things like that that I couldn't have done. If, and then I would sub until when I was in town. So I kept my certificate up. All. In fact, this is the first year that I have not taught. And how long has it been since you retired? Uh, I mean, sort of retired. I mean, since you stopped teaching full time. Since, okay. Uh, so it was 
65, and he was born in 1911, and I quit the next year, so about 70, 77. Okay. But I, so you've kept that up for quite some time. <laughs> yes, and then I subbed even mm -hmm. at, when we'd be in town. Mm -hmm. I would, and but I didn't do a lot of long term like I had before. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, and I quit this teaching just at Northern at Cleggan. I would go to Northern Hills too, because I the principal and I had taught sixth grade together one year at Russell Doherty. And Clara Lou and I'd been good friends, and uh, she said, "I need a sub." She called me to see if I would sub for her one day, and I said, "Well," I, she says, "Jerry, you're, you know me. You know I'm not going to eat you or anything." And I said, "Well, I'll try it. I've been," and, and so I got started teaching over at Northern Hills too, and. Then pretty soon it was so much bigger than Claydon, and the principal that I knew retired from Claydon, and they made it a choice school and things like that. And so I just stayed, and this is the first year that I have not taught. And no. I, oh, go ahead. the reason I didn't get into it this year is always before I'd been able to, you have to take those same tests, blood pathogens and security and privacy and stuff. And I'd gone to the lecture and stuff, and always before they'd had some computer set up where we could take them there. Well, I don't have a computer. So I, I, and they didn't let us do that. They had a new man, and he's gone, and the old man is back now, so I may be back teaching next year. But uh, uh, my very good, good friend had West Nile virus last summer, and she, normally has been a very healthy, active woman. She does all kinds of things, just like I always have. She was a scout leader. She helped. She would take the girls to Piedmont to that. If you know anything about Piedmont scout camp, to take them, but, but that's pretty rustic. Her husband had been a scout leader, and we'd gone to church together forever and stuff, and we'd been good friends for a long time. And so when we got her out of uh, rehab. She was in the hospital for quite a while at Integris and then up here at rehab. And so I was doing the daytime things because so the girls, her daughters, didn't have to take off work. And I kept thinking, well, I'll go get that done, you know, because they told me at Northern Hills, come on over there, they'd set it up for me. And then she had physical therapy three days a week and often a doctor's. Well, there was no point in those young women because I was teaching because I really wanted to. Those young women are teaching to keep their families going. Right. And uh, I decided, you know, I've always thought I'd know when it was time to quit and maybe that's what's happening because I made no effort to ever go and take that test or any. <laughs> I'm not really missing that. I was staying busy enough. So that's how I quit. And and that way Marie and Martha and uh, Sandy didn't have to take off work. We could get her to the beauty shop. And, and Lucky and I do things together all the time anyway. It was no problem. And I'd been so concerned about her. And was, I didn't think she lived the first time. Well, and, and Kay talks about the two of you in the same breath all the time. <laughs> Well, her matched set, from I, what I understand. Pra practically, <laughs> you know. yeah. So. She is an unusual woman. She really is. She can do anything. It sounds like you've done quite a lot yourself. <laughs> Well, what else? I mean, are, are there other things you want to talk about? You've mentioned your family and your teaching career. Well, I volunteer at the hospital mm -hmm. and uh, usually a couple of afternoons or a couple, sometimes it's morning, a couple of shifts a week. Mm -hmm. And I like that. And I belong to a book club and I belong to the, uh, and I've been helping with the sun thing the, for the kids at church at night, riding the bus with them. and working with the meals and and uh, I belong to a book club which I thoroughly enjoy. Uh, I have a breakfast group that I go to every Thursday morning that we've been meeting for seven years now at seven o'clock on Thursday morning. And That's dedication. 
well, it's been a good group, you know. <laughs> and I don't know, I just, and of course I have wonderful grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Uh, do you want to talk about them a little bit? Well, uh, my son lives in Austin, and he does not have any children, but, and he's about ready to retire. And my daughter lives in Dallas now, and she's a teacher, and she has two fantastic children who are grown, and Josh has two little ones, so I have two great-grandchildren. And uh, Carter is eight, and Cassidy will soon be three. That's an unusual name for a little girl, but they told Carter that he could pick the name for his little sister, and that's the one he picked, so. It's a good name. It is, and it suits her. Mm -hmm. And Carter and Cassidy goes together. Yeah, and, that's a nice uh, match. And uh, Ginger teaches at a parish day school, it, a parish Episcopal school. They okay. changed the name, and it's part of the uh, Episcopal chain there in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And she loves that. And well, we've we've covered a lot of ground. Yes, we are, have. Looking back, are, do you ever think that there are things that you might have done differently? Oh, maybe. Not anything I'm really upset about. Like all the summers that Syl and I spent after he retired, that we spent the summers in Creed, Colorado. And I, I, we went the day after Memorial Day and came home a couple of days after Labor Day. And those were the reasons I quit teaching full time early, so that we could do those things. And we both loved it. And so. Sounds like, I mean, Crete's got to be the most beautiful place in the world. Well, and you talked about all those summers you had down at Turner Falls. Yeah, when, when I was you a were little girl. Too. Yes, yeah. And those sound, those oh, sound pretty idyllic, oh, too. Oh, they were then, and, and it was great then, because that, but I went to Creed the first time when I was graduated from high school. Uh, Betty's mother and dad, Sill's brother, the uh, took me for my graduation present with them and with Betty the first time I'd been to Creed. I'd been other places and call it, but I had, and I just fell in love with it. And then after Syl and I got married, Dick and Anna May insisted that we go, and of course I was pushing too, because I remembered from when I was, well, Syl fell in love with it as much as I did. So we spent, oh, 15 summers out there. Oh. And we go early, and it is, it is just a gorgeous place. Is it up in the mountains? Yes. Okay. It's 8,000 feet in the valley. Ooh. And it is... That's bracing. <laughs> I, have you seen the fires that were at uh, the foot of, of Wolf Creek Pass? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's just 12 miles up the Rio Grande from there, uh, from South Fork, where the fires have been so bad mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. and They've had a couple of really bad oh, years. I have friends who've lived in Durango. And, oh, well, you know Mesa the area. Verde. Yeah, oh yeah. And those are wonderful places. And, well, see, and from Creed, we could go over those places mm -hmm. for weekend trips or day trips. That's or, what I was thinking. You're right in the neighborhood. Yeah, and we just so. left. We bought a trailer, but we just left it up there. Mm -hmm. And it left it stocked and everything, so we just like going to a summer cabin, mm -hmm. except nice. it was ours. And It's always mm -hmm. good to have those retreats. It was. Oh, I loved it, and Syl did too. He loved to fly fish, and I just liked being in the mountains, and I hiked and read, and if he went off someplace scary fishing by himself that I thought he might get, he could fall in, or I'd take a book and go with him and read while he fished, but keep him in sight, and I'd take a beach towel so I could move around and sit down then wherever he was. It was easier to carry a beach towel than a chair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it certainly is. Well, that, is there is there anything you'd like to add that we didn't talk about, or oh, anything you want to cover that we missed? I think we've done a pretty good job. <laughs> I feel like I poured my whole life down <laughs> your throat. Well, no, you have such great stories. So. Well, I, I just I feel like I've had a great life. Mm -hmm. Well, it it certainly sounds like it. And in looking back at all you've done and all you've accomplished, and what would you like people to remember? I hope they remember that I really loved what I, the things I did, that I loved life. Mm -hmm. And I hope I touched somebody's life 
like other people have mine and have made their lives a little better. That seems like a good place to end. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I'm just flattered to pieces that you even thought about me.